So I will record the session. All right, hi everyone, and uh, welcome to the inclusive teaching workshop on destigmatize impulsive feeling in your classroom, how to take risks and fail productively. My name is Lin Nguyen, my pronouns are she, her, and I am an inclusive teaching coordinator at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. So um, <clears throat> we're gonna spend the next 60 minutes or so um, together. So let's find out um, how diverse we are in terms of our discipline um, in the chat box or since there's only the three of us, if you don't mind share your, your name, your pronouns, if you have um, one that you prefer and your discipline. And the third thing I'd like to hear is what you look forward to this summer. Um, I'm Amanda Ferguson. I'm in the management department at the College of Business. Um, I, so I, um, my PhD is in organizational behavior. And I'm, as I mentioned to Lynn, just before you came on, Laura, I just, uh, um, I have a new dog. I just got yesterday, um, we rescued a greyhound. So I am looking forward to, but, you know, also a little apprehensive about getting the dog used to used to me and our home and my kids and we've never had a pet before so it's a little daunting but it's um it's a really it's got a really nice disposition so far I'm just sitting next to it here because it really likes me to be close by so that's what I'm looking forward to Amanda thank you do you teach um, I will not teach in the summer I teach in the MBA programs I'm usually off campus in Naperville or Schaumburg or um, and nights and weekends, usually during the um, fall and spring terms. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I know you, Lynn, but uh, <laughs> I'm Laura Heidemann. Um, she, her pronouns. Uh, I am uh, an associate professor in the Department of Sociology in the Center for Nonprofit and NGO Studies. So Amanda, what we have in common uh, is that I'm a sociology of organizations person among many hats. So I, I study organizational aspects of NGOs and the structures of, of donor funding systems. But that's so interesting. Yeah, so didn't know we had had an organizations person over in, in business school. Yes, my, my research is teams. So I, t I research team composition and team conflict. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm, and, I'm, I'm, and I have worked uh, for a while with Alicia Shadaman because oh, I'm yes. in the baccalaureate council. So anytime I hear an, an NGO person, I think of her too. Yeah, Alicia's fabulous. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, so that's my discipline. And then what I'm looking forward to this summer is I took over as director of undergraduate studies for sociology this year. And it's been swimming upstream all year to take on some major reforms in the department. So I'm looking to three months of my to-do list getting shorter instead of longer. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have more things I look forward to as I get further away from the semester. But right now I'm like, oh, I like the days where nobody's adding things to my list. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing. <clears throat> and I hope you get um, to take some time off and do something fun in the summer as well, so care. But um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much for being here. So um, <clears throat> the um, imposter phenomenon is prevalent among high achiever, uh, well-educated, um, especially well-educated women. Um, <clears throat> And and today I want to explore some concept about identity privilege, intersectionality, and their relationship to imposter syndrome. Um, the next thing I want to make the connection to is how can we destigmatize the imposter feeling in our classroom? And one way we could do that is to reframe mistake as opportunity and as a part of learning. And so um, demonstrate mistake that we can mistake can be either harmful or helpful. It depends on how we view them and then identify opportunities that come out mistake. And then the last thing that we're gonna talk about are um, some strategy that um, can help 
with imposter feeling, how to channeling that self-doubt into productivity. And so these um, strategy, I have been practiced some of them for many years. Um, a lot of them are evidence-based psychological research strategy. And um, some of them are for my leaf experience. So um, some of these strategy may work for your students, uh, some may not, but I hope that after today's session, you can go and um, take away the, the insight and, and lesson learned so that you can develop strategy that work best for your students. So um, <clears throat> identity. The, for example, I identify myself as a person of color, or a cisgender woman, and a non-native English speaker. So these are um, person of color, non-native English speaker. These are the visible identity that I don't have to say it out loud. It's visible to anyone. But then there's also some other invisible social identity like I'm a heterosexual woman, I'm a first generation immigrant. So the term social identity is one of the way of naming the complex interaction between how we understand ourselves and how others see us with respect to major social category. And so the identity is socially constructed and it can be readily apparent to other, but sometimes it's not. And sometimes the identity is shared with others or keep private. Um, sometimes they sell a claim and sometimes they ascribe by others. So um, <clears throat> my social identity is in form and shape the way I behave, the way I teach in a classroom, the way I lead in a community. And so that's why I want to um, talk about these concepts before we get into how it um, affects imposter feeling. Um, <clears throat> as privilege, these are a group of unearned cultural, legal, social, institutional rights, and they often extended to a group based on their social identity. So, for example, I may not have um, as many privilege as a person of color com comparison to a white person, but I have a lot more privilege as an able-bodied person compares, comparing to disabled um, or compared to people with disability. Um, so, I took this picture from the, the library. Um, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion guy. I thought it's very helpful. Um, they have a really good um, library guy here. If you haven't checked out, I highly recommend it. And I work on a show you uh, exercise on uh, the walk of the lack of privilege walk exercise, but I think we're gonna skip that. Um, I know Laura well, I know that she an expert in this area as well. But there's the exercise in this library guy where they show, um, it's just a privilege walk exercise. Amanda, have you heard of it before? So um, yeah, so check it out. If we have time at the end, we can go back to this video. It's, um, it's, it's very informative and helpful. <clears throat> Lynn, so, could I ask a, yes. a request? Could you put the link to the, the library chat? guide in the chat so that we can. Yeah, you know what, Laura, that's a great idea. I will include the link in the follow up email oh, about perfect. that. Yeah. Oh, so you. I will send a follow up email with the slides and the resources that I use to develop the presentation, and I will include the link to the library guide. Perfect. So, um, our social identity can inform and influence the way we see the world, understand, approach, and behave toward the world. And these social identities sometimes intersect, right? That's when we have intersectionality. That's uh, where this concept arises. So how different aspects of identity intersect and affect one experience, a privilege or lack of, um, the a um, the definition of intersectionality. And I want to show you, I did, some, um, I did this a test. I, I play with Google Gemini. It's the um, AI platform. If you have a Google account, you should have access to Google Gemini. I want to see how productive it is to generate 
um, pie chart um, based on the data that I give us. So I have here, this is the prompt that I give Google Gemini, and it were able to generate pretty basic but accurate uh, pie chart for me. So this pie chart represents why only 21% of corporate leaders in the U.S. are women, only 4% of corporate leader, a woman of color. And only, so those are the two pie charts. The one on your left showed that only 21% of corporate leader in the US are women. The other 79% are men. And then in this 21%, only 4% are women of color. Um, the rest a white woman. So it's appeared that the intersectionality has a compounding effect on women of color um, in corporate leadership in the US, right? This is just an example to show how sometime our intersect identity can have compounding effect on one person experience. <clears throat> so I wanna pause here and say, do you think intersectionality affect higher education? And do you experience it in your field as a woman in your field or as I don't know, have you experienced it here at NIU? Have you seen it in your student? Um, can you share with the group um, your thought on intersectionality in your classroom? Well, one thing I've noticed is around uh, gender and, and leadership um, is the two things. One is expectations of niceness in the classroom. Um, that, that oftentimes in my evaluations, what students are commenting on is whether they perceive me as nice or not. Um, Right. And and having seen male colleagues, um, you know, evaluations as as part of classroom about, you know, as, as part of our department evaluations, I've never seen my male colleagues evaluated in those same terms. Um, so that's that's one uh, one aspect of, of thinking about gender and leadership. I um I was gonna say I that's interesting I haven't I haven't personally experienced that, but I was thinking about um, I was think thinking about sort of this multiple aspects of identity, and um, one thing that I have used with my students a long time ago, which I haven't used recently because I don't ha I haven't taught undergraduate students in a while, and I, I used to do this in an undergraduate classroom as I used to do the 20 statements test where I would have them fill out 20 statements with the prompt I am. And then they would have to come up with 20 things that they would write after I am. And um, we used to do different things with, with that, like, you know, kind of considering which roles that they put down that were social roles versus personal traits and things like that. But I think, I think that kind of gets at the, the idea of this in, in sort of a like a free form. So it's it's different from the women and leadership aspect, but I, I guess that's what I was thinking about when you asked the question about this. Yeah, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Amanda, for sharing that. So I think that's a good inner way that it start it's get you to start thinking about where your student fall, right? So um, <clears throat> it's student and depend on the field. I don't know, Laura, in your field, is it dominant by men or is it kind of making its way to 50-50? Um, we, we have actually significantly higher numbers of female students than male students at this point. Faculty is closer to an even split, um, but depending on what career path they go into, some of our students may be heading into male dominated professions. Mm -hmm. um, many go into to law enforcement um, and some of our students are going into more female um, dominant professions like social work. I see. 
But I think as a whole, a society, perhaps these even the female student, they have that um, effect that society kind of put on them. They judge women differently than they would judge a, a male faculty. So thank you for sharing that. Amanda, so, did you want to say something? I, I, went, I wanted to ask a question. So is the imposter syndrome based, is it, um, is it in part determined by gender? Like are, are, are females more likely to have imposter syndrome than males? I, I just, I, I didn't yeah. know. And so yeah. maybe that, I was just curious. Yeah, your, your question is perfect um, to the next slide. <laughs> so oh, that's thanks. what we're getting. Thank you so much. So um, <clears throat> when the term first introduced by um, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes in 1978, that study were particularly study a group of very high achieving women, professional women, because at that time, for women to work outside of the home and in the professional field, they, they were the minority. So this study were based on a select sample of high achieving professional women. And so uh, defined as the internal experience of intellectual phony, which appeared to be particularly prevalent among women because of the situation that it were set in, in 1978. Now, um, <clears throat> more study has been done since and society as a whole also changed, right? So now there's, if you look for evidence is imposter syndrome prominent in women than in men, um, you would find a bunch of study to support that. But if you search for is imposter syndrome something that minority experience more than um, the majority group, you also find a lot of evidence that's supporting that. So I think the general consensus is it doesn't really depend on gender. If you are working in the field where your gender or your race or your um, sexual orientation make you an obvious minority, then you more likely will suffer from imposter syndrome. So like there's a lot of study that show black men in higher education have experienced imposter syndrome because they are a minority in their field. Does that kind of answer your question, Amanda? Yes, um, it does. I was I was wondering also about because I I often think about personality traits when it comes to my own research on team composition. So I was just thinking about whether there's a link or or empirical data that links it to um, things like um, core self-evaluations or self-esteem or self, you know, regardless of a social category sort of explanation, if there's also a, some people who have, who, who tend to see themselves with lower self-esteem, for example, experience this more than people who don't or, um, I was just curious about that also. <laughs> yeah, that I am not aware. One thing that across hundreds of research that have been done is the impulsive feeling usually prevalent among high achiever. So people mm -hmm. who like mm -hmm. achieve a lot, those are more likely to suffer from having these impulsive feeling, which sounds really crazy, yeah. but it is the case. So that's, that's the one factor that um, despite the differences in gender, despite the difference in race and class, high achievers suffer from this impulsive feeling. That's fascinating. Thanks. So I, I would put a lot of reference in the last slide of the presentation and you can go and take a look at it. It is fascinating. So it's in a way, it's like when you feel imposter feeling and self-doubt, you, you should be proud. Like you belong to the high achieving group. <laughs> That's one of the way that I tell myself and I tell my student. So I can give an example <clears throat> of how um, your student might experience this imposter feeling. And as professional, I am a woman of color in America. I'm a first generation graduate from college. Um, first generation immigrant uh, whose English is second language and I'm a woman in STEM. So I, I feel this feeling of self-doubt a lot as a student, as a professional, and I have 
develop a strategy to cope with it. And I also feel like when I talk freely about imposter feeling in my classroom, it's open the door, it's open the, the microphone for my students to start sharing their feeling and we kind of normalize it. And then we discuss this um, through a lot of us um, through the way we view mistake and failure, which I will show in the next few slides. So um, <clears throat> despite all of my social identity, some of which I can't change, like I'm a woman of color, um, an immigrant, um, I have a lot of earned social identity. I have a PhD in computational chemistry. I am a, an award-winning educator. Um, Sometimes, despite all of that, I still feel impossible feeling. I still feel like I don't belong in higher education. And I think I feel that way because society has assigned me several identity that associated with fewer capabilities and fewer privilege. And so despite being intelligent and capable, um, in many situations, people still treat me as if I'm less adequate and as a result, I often suffer from imposter syndrome or imposter feeling. Um, <clears throat> and I carry that self-doubt into my classroom, but then I try to leverage it so that I can become a better instructor and I can serve my student better. Um, <clears throat> So this feeling, the imposter feeling, can be caused by a number of factors, but then it can uh, compounding on the negative effect if it's um, coordinated with stereotype discrimination, microaggression, lack of role model, lack of inclusive, equitable mentorship, or lack of opportunity for leadership. Um, so in general, lack of representation it's can compounding on the effect. So uh, the common consensus is imposter feeling, especially prevalent among people working in a field where they, with their gender or race make them an obvious minority. Um, so to keep that in mind, if you have a very diverse group of students, um, see, where whether the the one who are the minority, whether that be the race or the gender, um, I guess especially for the one with the multiple marginalized identity, where the intersectionality encounter, um, I would pay attention to those students and see how they're doing in your class in terms of having imposter feeling. So. <clears throat> So the, now that we got over the part of what the impulsive feeling and how the intersectionality can make it worse, let's talk about strategy to destigmatize impulsive feeling in your classroom. And I think um, the most important thing to me um, and from the, the research that I uh, read is like, it's really how we view mistake in our classroom. So um, <clears throat> I think, I have three questions here and I think I'm gonna go ahead and show them all to you. I wonder if you could share a personal experience where mistake ultimately lead you to significant learning or growth. And then in that story that you share, what are some strategy or practices that help you learn from your mistake? And then taking that from your experience how do you create a culture that encourage open discussion and learning from mistake in your classroom? And even if you haven't tried this, if you have not tried to create a culture that encourage open discussion and learning, how would you create it like after today? So you can take a minute or two and, and think about these questions and, and we can go from there. I can share first. So um, I immigrated to the US in 2004 at the age of 21. And I couldn't speak English. I, I know minimum English. 
but I I know chemistry. I was really good at math. So I started at the Oklahoma City Community College and I enroll in uh, a lot of math and science courses. And my favorite class were general chemistry. And I still remember the professor name, uh, Courtney Dodd. So I remember that because I remember I failed the first exam and it's, it just blow my mind away because I know chemistry. So I know I failed the first exam because I didn't understand what were asked of me and I couldn't make it out. So that's why I messed up the number of the equation and I, I failed the Well, when I say I failed, I'm pretty sure I got a C, but that failed lower for me. So <clears throat> I, after done being sad and heartbroken, I find her and in my book in English, I ask her, I'm not stupid. I try to convince her. I'm learning English. This is my first semester in America. I, I don't understand the English. I knew chemistry. And so I keep remembering that she, she chuckle and she say something that this is my first semester teaching too. I were working in, in industry before now. So <clears throat> she started asking me if I have a textbook. And I say no, because I couldn't afford it. She asked me if I... Um, did the homework and I say no I say you should study from the the notes that she provide so she told me that the library have um her, her textbook on reserve and I asked her I, I didn't know the library right as a first generation immigrant and first generation going to college I have nobody who can help me so I have no idea how to navigate the higher education um, systems. But when I asked her, so what do I need to do to score better on your exam in your class? And she told me that do the homework. After each chapter in the textbook, there's a lot of homework. If you just do them and understand how to do them, then you will be fine on my exam. So she told me about the library. She told me about the homework. So I went to the library, check out the, the book, start doing all of the odd number homework because they have the answer key at the back of the book. And then um, and when I have time to go through that and look up and understand the problem, do the homework, um, the next exam, I score an A and I did really well. Um, and so I continue to do that way. And I was successful uh, achieve an A in her chemistry class. So that was one of my personal experience and the strategy and practice that I think I used in there was I, I do a lot of reflection. I slow down and I trying to reflect on my mistake and um, and then I seek for feedback. I come and find her and, and try to tell her that I'm not stupid. I just didn't understand English. So how can I do better on your next exam? So after I get the feedback, I do more reflection and I started studying more and so I remember that and I bring that back into my general chemistry here at NIU I try to create a culture that encourage um, open discussion and learning from mistake I try to normalize being wrong or making a mistake in my class I keep telling my student it's okay to mistake it's, it's normal to make mistake as long as we learn from it then we should be okay um, I and then in practical strategy, which I will talk a little bit about later, I allow my student multiple attempts on the homework and only the highest score attempt will be recorded. So some those are some of the strategy and practices that I use in my classroom. Hope that helps. Um, I would like to hear if you have done some of the strategy or practices. Sure. Um, there's a lot of questions here. So I'm, I, I, maybe I'll take the last one first. I teach a, a Teams class and I feel like we do this a lot. And I think it's, I just didn't maybe make the connection, but um, so the basis for this class, it, it's an undergraduate class for upperclassmen. And the basis of the class is that in every class session, they work with a different team on a different type of team task with an assigned leader. So everybody gets to lead at least once or twice in the semester. And then um, sometimes it's a task where they have to build Legos. Sometimes it's a task where they have to make a decision. Sometimes they have to discuss a case. They have to lead a small group discussion. Sometimes they have to lead a virtual team. Sometimes they have to 
um, build towers or they have to figure out a puzzle or something. Um, sometimes they have to do a creativity set of creativity challenges. So it's different, it's different things they have to do. But um, every, every time we do that, um, I usually have some aspect of the task that is something that they can't necessarily plan for, but that they learn through discovery. And then we always debrief what happened. So I have to set this up quite carefully at the beginning to explain to them that um, I, I never grade them on how they do as a team leader. I only grade them on the quality of the feedback they provide because in some of these situations, they will they will not succeed in the task or something might happen to make it challenging. Or And so I don't want them to feel as if they're on the spot for being a perfect leader. It's actually much better that they... Um, that they try something that puts them out of their comfort zone. So they're, they're graded more on their reflection of what happened. And what I, what they do after every activity is they have to write, they write um, what went well, what they would do differently the next time, what the team did well, what the leader did well, what, what they think they could have improved. And then they debrief it with each other. And so then they learn, um, they learn how to give feedback and how to receive feedback. And so every session we do that. And by the end, I think it really helps them develop a lot of confidence um, because they practice that a lot. And it's all about reflecting on, you know, what they did. So for example, one example is for a case discussion on team conflict, I have the um, I have the team leader try a different leadership style than they're used to and see how it feels. Right. And usually they don't like it, but they, I give them some ideas of strategies to try. But then, you know, then they write about, oh, it was really hard to do this because of this. And then their team, but their team will sometimes say, I really liked that you did this. Or I, you know, I could see that you, you were, it was hard for you to do this, but you did a good job. And, you know, so I think it's just, um, it's just sort of setting that tone early on and then just practicing it over and over. I think really helps with that class. Not all of my classes are like that. It's just the format of that one. But I think I didn't realize that the, that I was doing that. But I think I, that I was doing maybe number three through some of that. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. That's so amazing. Um, do the student have opportunity to rotate leadership to be yeah. in leadership role? Yes, every um, so I, I use the Kellogg team assigner algorithm. And so it minimizes the number of times any one student works with any other student in a team. So they always have a like a different set of team members and the, a different leader and a different task. So by the end of the class though, you know, so we'll have like maybe 10 different teams and teams tasks. So if I have a class of 20 students or whatever, they really get to know each other well, but they aren't, they aren't with the same team the whole time, but they rotate. And so then they develop like this cohort feeling because they get to know everybody in the class through doing the activities. Thank you so much for sharing that. It sounds like a very fun class to be in. It's a fun, I love to teach it. I love, I love to, um, yeah. but it's, it's really very much like this, but I don't actually use the word mistakes too much, but so I have to think about if I should use the word mistakes. I, I don't know. And the reason I use the word mistake because I taught chemistry, right? So there's a lot of problem with they just make a minor mistake or a major mistake. Or uh -huh. if they make a minor mistake in one of the step in a multiple step problem, then then it's ultimately end up in a major mistake. So if it's a um if it's a multiple choice exam, yes. a minor mistake can have like catastrophic consequence because I can't see the step by step. Yeah. And then in the homework, I were able to identify where they make a mistake. So the using the word mistake is just based on my discipline and then Oh, that's interesting. Then, okay. Yeah. Now that I hear you, um yeah, it's I don't know if it's a good word. I think it depends on the discipline. Well, because I was thinking about number one, and I'm sorry, Laura, I'm not I'm not trying to dominate the discussion here. I, I was thinking about number one, and if I think about something as a mistake, I was thinking about when you were saying that you were learning English. Um, when I did my PhD, I was in London, England for five years, and 
even though they speak English, it's a totally, they use very different terms, right? And so I made a mistake um, by, by going to, I went to a colleague's home they had invited us for tea and I didn't know that tea meant dinner. I thought it meant a cup of tea, like drinking tea. And so we, it took us way longer to get there than we thought. And so we arrived very late and I felt terrible because I thought initially I thought, oh, it's going to be okay. We can just have a cup of tea later but they had kept dinner waiting for us be, because I made that mistake. So I, I learned, but, um, but when you were talking about sort of, um, sort of this, like studying you, and you didn't do as well, I was thinking, you know, of, 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 of a time that I had a similar experience in school when I worked really hard on a, on an assignment for an advertising class. And this is really what I thought I wanted to do with my life. And I did, I, I got a terrible grade on it, a D or a C or something. And I worked, I worked for hours on it with a partner. And so I couldn't believe that we had gotten such a poor grade. And I tried to get an internship kind of in that area. And I wasn't selected for the internship, but it kind of helped me see that I was, while I wasn't succeeding in this area, I was succeeding in this other area of organizational behavior. And so you know, it helped me learn and grow in sort of like what I had some aptitude for as a, but I wouldn't have called that a mistake. Like it, it was just a learn, it was just kind of a learning curve of maybe this isn't the area for me, this, this other area might be for me. So that's why I was just curious about the term mistake, yeah. whether it, I, it's something that is like the, what you use for this, for imposter syndrome or if it could be something different. You know, Amanda, um, when I designed this workshop, I had no idea that I'd be delivering it to two organizational psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> so the term I use is more, you you way past that term. You already recognize that mistake as opportunity or, or mm -hmm. mistake as intelligent discovery for you. You discover that, hey, I may not be able to do this well, but I should do this instead. Yeah. So this is the way that I'm trying to think of in framing the the. Mm -hmm. lesson no, it's it's making me so think a lot. So I, I really <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate it very much. So, so anyway, yeah, I'm going to stop talking sharing. now. So Laura, Laura, Laura can have a chance. I was going to say I don't I don't use the mistake language in the classroom either. What I usually talk about is. Um, building grace into my courses. This idea that, you know, you're learning and, you know, the first time you may, it may be a swing and a whiff. Um, and, and, you know, you miss the ball and, you know, so I, I try to do things where it's like when we're doing a repeated assignment, I drop your, your lowest scores um, or, something so that so that students have that ability to to learn but also know that hey if you try I'll give you feedback and you can try try again um yeah I was really interested Amanda to hear about the the leadership um uh, exercises you do because I do a leadership exercise in in my social movements class mm -hmm. um but they are in the same groups all semester, but they each take turns leading, um, I call them student facilitated discussions. And so learning how to facilitate a discussion, they do get graded on it, but mm -hmm. it's usually set up in a way where if you um, don't, you know, you're not happy with your facilitation grade, you have an opportunity to like there's there's one more week of facilitated discussions than there are students in the group so that somebody can redo it if they want to. Well, that's nice. I actually um, I don't think that's a bad thing, Laura, about really there's some great research showing that familiarity teams working with the same teammates over time can really help them grow. And so I think it's just, the nature of this class is it helps them mm -hmm. to to not to, to have lots of different teams that they're on. But I think in many classes, it does help to have a smaller group that they can develop with. Yeah. And, and what I'm trying to do with the way I'm, I'm trying to teach leadership through this is teach an inclusive model of leadership that says, right, you don't win by, 
you know, getting through the exercise as quickly as possible. You, you do as well as possible in a group when everybody is, when there's space for everyone to make contributions and you build on each other's ideas. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed with thinking about leadership this way, like leadership as listening and supporting and facilitating as opposed to leadership as domination is that many of my students who um, are shyest in the classroom actually do best at these leadership tests when they think about leadership as inclusion. Um, they actually show sensitivity to group dynamics and have that eye on who's talking or who's not and you know whose voice has been heard and not. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting thing for me to observe in, in teaching this is the way that our definitions of leadership in the classroom might make space for students who, who have that imposter syndrome and think I can't be a leader. Um, to recognize the different kinds of leadership that they leadership skills that they possess and have those celebrated. Thank you, Laura. And it's it's really amazing that you both incorporate teaching leadership into your courses because I think it's so it depends on how leader view mistake or failure as an organization or a group can grow, right? So maybe you want to take away some of the thing that we discussed here today and, and incorporate into your leadership skill teaching to your student. Because when you have a leader who, who have like zero tolerance for failure or mistake, the thing is mistakes still happen. You just don't hear about it. So it's maybe more productive depend on the situation and, and the discipline where you can try to prevent or catch smaller mistakes before they can actually do harm or, or explode into a, a major complex failure. So thank you both for sharing. Um, so the next thing I want to um, show here is um, how we can, how, how mistake or failure uh, can be both harmful and helpful. It depends on the mindset, right? So if, if someone with a deficit or a fixed mindset, then mistake can be taken as a sign that we don't have potential. Um, you either born with it or you don't. You either can do it or you can't. Like, um, have you to ever had a professor who say things like, look to your left, look to your right, only half of you are going to make it in my class. This happened to me. This, this happened um, to me in my chemistry um, class. So <clears throat> or, or sometimes there's a professor to this day at NIU, they would say things like, if, if you struggle in my class, you might want to change your major. And I teach chemistry. So those things I hear from my students. So this kind of message sent a, a thick mindset or a deficit mindset message. You don't have what it takes. You don't belong here in higher education. So um, <clears throat> it can be quite harmful because we should have shown that students who see that their instructor endorse this kind of belief, um, that's only some student have it and some student just don't. When they find themselves making mistake in a class, they, they can often feel like they an imposter in a classroom, they imposter in college, and they that can really set them back in terms of seeking help, um, asking questions, finding study group or tutor, and all the things that we know actually contribute to the student success, right? So, um, I don't know how you learn, but um, I don't get things effortlessly, perfectly, immediately. I need repetition, I need practice, testing, failing, learning. I need to review, reflect, um, get feedback, rethink, and ultimately learn something. So I make that very clear to my student in my class. That's the way most humans learn. I share a story of how I learn. And I think as a Husky community, as an IU, um, community of scholar and learner, 
do we have a mindset culture where uh, we believe that a good intelligent skill or ability are fixed? Do you either have them or you don't? Or do we want to create a culture where we think that it's possible to grow, develop, and learn new skill, um, ability, and other aspects? So um, helpful mistake is when um, we can be with and help our student viewers as an uh, opportunity for a reflection, for review, for more practice, uh, for getting feedback, and, and then rethink and learn from there. I'm going to pause here for just a minute. Do you have any um, comment or question on this? All right, so, um, so how can we help students fail productively um, in your classroom and at NIU in general? Um, so this, this is just a few things to consider. So when you're in a new field, like it, when you're doing research, you're at the leading edge of your field. Um, failure is actually discovery, right? So if you help reframing and be very explicit with your student, that because we are at the leading edge of the field, um, when we have a hypothesis that didn't work out, it just view it as an opportunity to, to let you know that this didn't work, so let's try a different hypothesis, let's try something else. Um, so you can call these intelligent failure, or you can call them um, discovery. Um, Another thing I want to suggest is in teaching. So complex and major mistake often happen um, not by itself, but often it's happened because there's smaller, minor mistake that were not caught and corrected. So how can we help students make small mistakes so they don't make big and catastrophic mistakes? And I think I think I heard uh, both of you share how you allow your student multiple attempt, right? Or drop the lowest score on an exam. Um, so when you allow students to submit multiple drafts and then you can review or your grad student can review and then give it to the student for revision, that's one way that we can um, quickly identify minor mistakes so that the student can correct it and then don't fail the, the, the assignment or, or the, the class. Um, so that, um, and then other thing too, multiple attempt on homework quizzes or sometimes retake exam if you do that. Um, in real life, how can we set up to catch and correct mistakes before they cause harm, particularly for you in the power, uh, in the position with power? or for you when you teach your student to be the future leader, um, if they lead an organization or a group, um, they need to be able to cultivate a culture where they can catch and correct mistakes before um, the bigger, more complex mistake happen. So a simple checklist can prevent basic mistake, but at the same time, uh, we have to go to the checklist mindfully and uh, not mindlessly. Another thing to consider is avoid a culture of zero tolerance for mistake or failure. Because as human, mistake will happen. Um, but if you create a culture where you don't tolerate minor mistake or failure, mistake will happen. We just don't hear about them. And those there will be no opportunity to learn, no opportunity to improve. And um, a more complex mis mistake might be the result of that. So, <clears throat> the way we view mistake and failure often affects student learn, learning and growth. And students perceive that, um, I'm sorry, uh, were you hearing me? Okay, I have my microphone way down because I cough. Um, anyway. Uh, that's so better. It was very quiet. I could still oh hear you, but God. that's really much better. Thank you. I'm sorry, you should have said something. I see you getting over a cough, so I had my microphone down and I didn't realize that. I'm so sorry. Um, so uh, as 
professor in the classroom, how can you help students turn this imposter feeling or the self-doubt feeling into productivity? Um, because um, the, the imposter feeling is affect the student who do well as well as the student who struggle. But the student who do well, um, they sometimes question like, is it possible that I'm doing well? I'm not a genius, you know? So um, it would have a negative effect on the student who do well, as well as uh, the, the student who struggle. So with that said, imposter syndrome is very common. It's a fair, it's a shared experience. Uh, many people in many fields, regardless of gender and race, um, will feel will have that feeling at some point in their uh, life. And so strategy to overcome that include finding a support system, um, setting realistic goals for your student, um, and then help them setting realistic goals for themselves. Um, celebrate their accomplishment and celebrate a small success to build confidence. Um, and then every time if they have negative thought and you should teach them to challenge the thought, like ask them the question, do they have evidence to back up that claim or look at all the achieved accomplishment that they've done um, to, to help combat with the negative thought when they arise. And then model behavior, practice self-compassion. Um, the last thing I want to mention is advocating. So for the student um, and as well as for you, if you face this, this self-doubt feeling, advocate for yourself and advocate for other. So one thing that I find very helpful for me to turn my impulsive feeling into a self coach or into productivity is I actually leverage it to drive me to do more and do better. Um, and I can share one example is the, the story about the chemistry textbook on reserve. So because I had that experience, when I share with my student in my classroom, I, I tell them that I didn't have money to buy textbook. I understand textbook is very really expensive. This is how I deal with it. So I think I normalize being poor in college, help a lot of my students. Um, and then I also put my textbook at the library on reserve um, before faculty at NIE were asked to do the same thing. Because I tell the student, you can go there, check out a book and study, take photo of it and go home and study in your group or um, make photocopy. Um, so I normalize being poor as a student. I normalize um, using the library, sending them there. So I kind of turn my experience into activism in that way because I, I put the textbook on reserve to help students who couldn't afford textbook and they can still check it out and study. And um, another thing that I, I embrace in my classroom is I embrace my accent. I tell my student that I English is not my first language. I learn it as, as a, an adult. And so I say that that's the word that I know I can't pronounce well. And I tell my student, don't let me get away with it. Like stop me and ask me to write it down or ask me for clarification. But then by telling my story and reframing my accented English, not because I'm not intelligent, I embrace my immigration story and many students later come to me and share that they were afraid to speak up in class because they also speak English with an accent, or they share the story of their parent um, who are immigrants. And so um, those things that I do to just like reframing the story, uh, advocate for myself, it's become transformative for my student too. And it have a really positive impact on my student. All right, so um, I think we're gonna skip this, <laughs> celebrate your accomplishment. These are just some reflection uh, for you to take away. Um, reflect on your identity privilege 
and or lack of and how they inform your impulsive feeling and then how you can create a culture that encourages open discussion and learning from mistakes in your class and know that this culture will help um, minority students depend on your discipline um, woman is a minority in STEM, but woman not a minority in early childhood education. So like men in that field might have a more profound impact um, with impulsive feeling because they are a minority. And then the last thing that I hope um, all of us going to do is think about how we can challenge the dominant narrative and practice in our field so that we can ensure that underrepresented students don't feel like imposter. And here are my contact information. <clears throat> and I will send you a follow-up email with the slide as well, all the resources and the link to the library guide. And thank you so much for being here with me. I'm gonna stop the recording.